Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our study and the admonitions that have been given by Mrs. White, on the subjects that we have been addressing from the book of Zephaniah, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we might have the wisdom to understand how to properly apply this to the time in which we live and to our own lives at this time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on this Sabbath with grateful hearts for this day of rest, for this day that we may commune even more with you so that we may learn more of you, so that we may learn more of what it takes for our characters to become more like yours. Help us now, Father. Direct us as we read this epistle. Help us to consider that which we need to know. Please guide us now. Please direct us. Help us to understand so that when you are presenting before us the items that need most to change, that we may be able to accept them, that we may be able to grow in the way that you would have us to grow so that the message that you would have us to give may be clearly given to this world. May your angels attend us. May your spirit be upon us <clears throat> and upon us each one. Help us now. Direct us as we open these words. For this we thank you. <clears throat> For this we praise you. Now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. What is a test of discipleship, as we covered this last week? How we treat our brother? Correct. That's a, a nice summation. The title of this paper, as I'm scrolling back to it, Unity is a test of discipleship. Where there is no unity, there is no discipleship. Mrs. White presented this. This is one of these manuscripts where only portions were seen fit to present before the church. As we have been reading the entire manuscript, we see many things that she has been giving us as an example. Now, to recap from this last week, we need to bring into our practical life all the pleasantness that comes from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If we are co-laborers with him, we shall do the work that he did when he was in this world. It is essential that we know how to pray more, how to press our petitions effectively to the throne of grace, and the rich current of love that God may flow into the heart to be diffused in kind words and deeds of tender compassion. If this rich current of love of God, of the love of God, is not flowing into the heart, then we do not see kind words or deeds of tender compassion being presented to others. 
Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, Christ declares. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. <clears throat> we are all little ones, as far as Christ is concerned. We are all yet children learning more of his compassion and his love for us. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. For I have found the sheep which was lost. Luke 15, 3 to 6. See what the good shepherd will do when one of his sheep is lost. He goes out into the desert and searches until he finds it. When it is found, he takes it upon his shoulders or to his breast of infinite love. And his song of rejoicing reaches the heavenly courts. I have found my sheep which was lost. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hand be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. <clears throat> he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. Is this not a promise to us today? That no matter how far we stray, no matter what the circumstances have been, that Christ's love is everlasting for those that truly love him. Seek the Lord most earnestly. Amid the reproaches of the world, amid all the trials that come, work on. Let not thine hand be slack. Do not fail nor be discouraged. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee. Remember that he is a present help in every time of trouble. Rest in his love. He will save. He will joy over thee with singing. Again, Zephaniah 3.17. This is the work that God expects everyone to do who claims to believe in him as his personal savior. He desires all who come unto him to be strong because they take hold of his strength. Let them learn to produce their cause to press to the throne of grace, taking God at his word. The Holy Spirit <clears throat> will come to the believing, praying soul who is meek and lowly. This spirit must come to every child of God. The spirit of accusing, of envy and self-surmising is inspired by Satan. Those who take part in the work here should not stand as independent atoms, but as a solid wall, which the Lord makes firm and immovable. Does God expect us to be accusing? Does God expect us to be casting out other brothers and sisters? Is this the work that he is calling us to do?
We are not to be independent atoms. We need to be working together. So that's the work. Um, what's this to do? Satan, <clears throat> Satan is playing the game of life for the souls of men. Will those who claim to be Christians work with him to weaken the force of the army and to strengthen the forces of the enemy? Now, that's an amazing question. When we have others that are making accusations, that are looking to cast other people out, it is more because Satan, our accuser, is afraid that in unity we will find strength. And that there may be those in the unity that may be able to assist to help make the points that are most necessary so that this message can be clearly presented to the world. Every worker <clears throat> is now to be wide awake, but he is not to train his imaginations to see defects in others and designs and mischief against himself. He is not to use his capability to tear down the influences of those whom God has chosen to do his work. Keep quiet. Let the precious talent of speech be used to win minds to God. Silence is eloquence unless in patience, kindness, and tenderness you can speak to win souls to Christ's side. Separate from the tempter and cling to the Lord. Where else did Mrs. White state, silence is eloquence? Well, she stated this in many places, um, but the main one you're probably thinking of has to do with uh, um, the daily controversy. Exactly. Now, why is silence so eloquent under that? Well, the problem is that they were they were in conflict with each other. And, exactly. And she said that if they were to follow the example of, of unity, to listen to one another, to understand each other's points, then the, un, the, the understanding of the daily would become clear to them. But in this sort of controverted dialectic environment, uh, they really weren't going anywhere. They were destroying uh, the work. They were tearing down each other and destroying the work, correct? Uh, that's correct. Uh, I wasn't building them up, but it was, it was Sadie and Dissension. Right. Is our situation today any different than the situation with the daily all those years ago? Okay, well, if, if, if you want to look at a parallel, I mean, I don't, um, I mean, definitely they, they were at odds with each other and not listening to one another. Okay. Um, now, there is, there is somewhat of a parallel here because, I mean, one is we, we know that when we studied into the daily, um, that a lot of this had to do with early writings, page 74. So it was trying to understand a message that had been given in the past. We had one group saying, well, Ellen White was quite clear that the pioneers were united on the true view of the daily. You had another group who tried to interpret the past passage differently. Um, but neither group was really trying to understand the whole issue. That is, even the people who supported Ellen White's statement didn't necessarily understand the issue of the daily. 
right? And they and they didn't understand how to uh, reconcile with those that differed with them. In in some ways, they were both right. Not that I'm I'm agreeing with the the new view of the daily, but they had they had taken a position. Well, since we understand the sanctuary message, we need to go back and examine what we understood about the daily before. And how did that affect it? And, and there are some changes that come about as a result of understanding Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. That is, there are some minor points, let's say, in Miller's understanding um, that needed to be corrected in light of that. But what they did was basically rewrite uh, the entire understanding of the daily. So if you're going to make a parallel with now, and some of the things that are being taught. Um, uh, you know, the, to me, there's a pretty clear parallel. We have to go back and examine together um, our understanding of certain points, right? Dealing with Trump, dealing with uh, July 18th, and so forth. Um, things that didn't happen the way that we expected because we have more light. But, you know, we can't... Uh, you know, dig in on that, on our positions and not move forward, which I think partly was what was happening with the old view of the daily. Um, but also the new view of the daily went too far. It, it ended up rejecting foundational truths. So, so at least that's how I would see it. If you're going to make a parallel. That's no different than what I was thinking. The parallel here is we need to understand that we are seeing today what Mrs. White was experiencing for that time regarding the daily. She noted that when there was unity on the subject of the daily, and we're not speaking in the latter part of her ministry, we're speaking at the very beginning of her ministry, that all were understanding the subject in the same manner. But toward the end of her ministry, they were not. So here we have, silence is eloquence, unless in patience, kindness, and tenderness, you can speak to win souls to Christ's side. In order for there to be unity among the disciples, if there are those <clears throat> that, will not, that will not exhibit patience, they will not exhibit kindness, and they will not exhibit tenderness, that they speak in harsh tones, in tones <clears throat> seeking separation and to cast others out, then are they disciples? Verily I say unto you, Christ declared, <clears throat> if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Matthew 18, 19, and 20. I ask all who claim to be Christians, who profess to believe the truth for this time, to take God at his word. What is she saying in this statement? I ask all who claim to be Christians, who profess to believe present truth, to take God at his word. <clears throat> Let us believe this promise, so full of encouragement and assurance of every believing Christian. Talk a great deal less unbelief and talk more faith. Agree as touching what you desire. And then approach the throne of grace. Look not upon outward discouragements, but
but take the word of God just as it reads. Ask him for help in your perplexities, and light will come and blessing will come. If we are doing this, and we are asking him for help in our, in our perplexities, are we not given the promise that light will come and that the blessings are coming? Is this not a reason for us to take heart, to be joyful, and to exhibit this patience, tenderness, and kindness with our brothers and sisters. The Lord has declared that if two agree as touching anything and meet to present their petition, they are not alone, for he meets with them. It is the prayer offered for some definite purpose that is heard and will be answered Unity in prayer is honored by God. In unity, there is strength. In division, weakness. Unity is the element so much needed in the work of God. This drawing apart, this scolding and fretting, this pettish spirit of fault finding might better be cut away. For it is a root of bitterness springing up whereby many are defiled. He who is imbued with the love of God will be at unity with his fellow workers. What does this statement say to us today? How do you take this? How should we each one accept what she has written here? I would think that if we're going to take her counsel seriously, um, we would be seeking to find unity. Now, I mean, the movement tried to become united in the past, but they went about it the wrong way. Agreed. So, I mean, one is they tried to do it from the top down, which doesn't work. Um, but it says unity in prayer here. Right. Um, that is, we need to figure out what our purpose is and unite in that purpose, seeking for God's guidance and help. Um, so, I mean, unity, as I said before, is an individual work. There's a work that we all have to do as individuals. Um, but if we're, if we're at odds in our purposes, in our goals, then we're not going to be united in prayer. Um, an example, you know, I guess this is something that, that was hard for me to learn. So um, I'll try to try to explain it this way. So let's say you have um, a church member who um, is um, and, and it could be, let's say somebody who's leading out, they have a goal. They say, this is our goal. This is what we're working towards, but they make decisions that are counterproductive to that goal. We, we have to accept that if, if the results that they produce are always different than what they are proposing, that actually those results are what they actually want. I don't know if I'm saying it very well, but you understand what I'm saying, anybody? Explain yourself better. Okay, so <clears throat> I wish I, I, I could think of a good example right now, but... Um, Let's say you have a politician. A politician is talking about how we need to be at, uh, you know, we need to be tolerant toward each other. 
and we need to work together. But yet their policies are creating intolerance and um, alienating people who aren't working towards their, this supposed tolerance and unity. Um, you know, an example of this would be uh, Trudeau, uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada. His words say one thing, but his actions say another. And, and so when you see the results, you can actually determine what the person's real purpose is. That the words don't align with the results. Is that helpful? That's that's an excellent point. Right. Now, so when when people have a, a purpose that is their own their own place or position in the movement, when they're motivated by jealousy and suspicion, they might say some nice words. But the result is going to be different than their words. Because behind the scenes, they're going to be doing things to cause um, suspicion. And, um, you know, they're going to malign people's characters. Um, but on the outside, they, they may be showing this, right? They may be showing, you know, that we, we need to work together. I mean, the church does this all the time, Right. It talks about unity, but it's doing things that are actually creating disunity. So, so there has to be a universe, a, a, a unity in purpose. And so that's the individual part. I mean, if I'm at odds with God, it doesn't matter what I try to do. I can't bring about unity. So when, when the movement tried to bring about unity in the way that it was doing it, it was actually causing division, isolation, uh, hurt feelings. Um, you know, it wasn't doing anything to really bring about unity. It was just a word. Yeah, we call it lip service. Yeah. And, and it's a little bit more than lip service in some ways because um, – I mean, we see this, it's, it, I mean, it is double speak in a sense. Um, because if you want to have unity, I mean, there are ways to bring about unity. But, you know, you can't herd cats. Um, and that's often what's trying to be done. I don't know. Maybe I don't think I really expressed myself well, but hopefully people can get the point that if we're not seeking to be united with Christ, and if we're not seeking to be united with our brethren, um, we're actually seeking we're, our our motives, our our intent. The the result will be disunity. It doesn't matter what we say. Well, when you're trying to promote unity, you don't set policies that create exclusivity. Right. Yeah, that shut people out. That's right. So I, I guess the best example that I could see is from my own experience. So in Warburg Church, in the past, when you know I moved there like 35 years ago, um, the way that the church operated was on consensus. That is, the church operated as a group. There wasn't a board that made decisions and then uh, gave the, the results of their decisions and demanded that the church follow those decisions. If the board met and made a decision, every board member would go and talk to other church members to get their opinion about the decision that had been made by the board. And if there wasn't... Um, full agreement if there were people who were not happy with the decision of the board then the board members went back together to meet to uh, include these other views that is they felt that the church needed to be 
united in the decisions that the board made. If the board made decisions that were not accepted by the vast majority of the church, even sometimes just one person's objection to a decision made by the board would be enough for the board to look at the situation again. And often the, the whole decision of the board would be changed by just the voice of one person in the church. Because what they wanted was a consensus. If you have consensus, then you have support. Right? Correct. Correct. You don't have consensus. You have no support. And you have division. You have people who feel left out. They feel disenfranchised from what the church is doing. But and, in <clears throat> and that was the strength of Warburg Church, you know, that that still exists to a large part, but it, it's not as strong as it used to be. So they were dealing in the principles of democracy is what you're saying. Well, well, the de democracy is is the tyranny of the majority. I, I wouldn't call it democracy. I, I just call it consensus. That is. People, even if they disagreed on some points, because they were included in the decision-making process, could still support it. It doesn't mean that everybody had to agree to every single detail, but people needed to feel like their, their view was at least heard and understood, because in only in that way could you get support. I mean, even when I was a child and I organized all the the activities in the neighborhood, um, what I had to do is I had to make everybody feel like they were a part of what was happening, whether it was the little kids, because if you're going to play football, you need more than, you know, four or five people. So you'd have to get everybody in the neighborhood rally together to go and play a football game. So that means people had to feel like they had a place in it. You couldn't just run over the little kids or ignore them or not pass to them, you know, so in order to get people to work together, they have to feel like they're part of what's happening. And a good leader knows how to make people feel like they're a part of what's happening so that they will support it. Um, but in, in this, what, what we find often happens, people want unity on their terms, which means we want people to follow us and they're not willing to have things examined or questioned. And, and unity doesn't come about that way because we need to trust that God is in charge, that he knows and understands more than we do. As we studied last night, you know, his idea of righteousness is not like our idea of righteousness. And if we're united with Christ, and we're doing righteousness, we have his character, unity will be the result. But if we're acting in the part of Lucifer, of being an accuser of the brethren, unity will not result because Satan brings about division. When we accuse and malign other people's character, we're doing the work of Satan. We can justify it because we can say we're right, but it's not redemptive. And it's usually done as a way, a means of self-justification for our own sins. It's a very difficult <clears throat> thing for us to note mm -hmm. that those that would be accusing would be doing the work of the adversary. Because we would rather not see that occurring within our ranks. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard not to do yourself when you see these problems. I mean, you know, you can't be judgmental of judgmental people. Right. You know, because you, you, so trying to figure out how to, but when you're in this sort of divisive environment where, where uh, hurt feelings have occurred, uh, people are... Um, are struggling with the differences that exist. I mean, often we can get caught up at that ourselves. 
Now, now Rosanna made a, a comment here, uh, which says, give it to God, let it rest, do not labor. Now, that, that's sort of a tough one in the sense that uh, right now we feel that, that we're being called to, to somehow come into unity with our brethren. Now, we could. So here's an option. So one of the things that we could have done is um, we could have stopped doing our studies and just joined in the studies that were being done by the American and the Canadian groups. Stay quiet. Uh, that, 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 that wouldn't work. <laughs> well, I know, We've but... learned too much. We learned too much. Well, I understand. But I'm just just let me, you know, sort of frame this. OK, so, I'm sorry. And, and this is one thing that I've done my entire life is. You you have the people in charge. And you try the best you can to support what they're doing. Right. You know, I, I've done this in the self-supporting work. I did this when I was at the School of the Prophets. Even if I thought differently about something, even if I was shut out from something, I did my best to work towards the goals that whatever institution I was involved in, whether it's a local church, a self-supporting work, that God's going to take care of it. So you trust that God to work it out, as, as Rosanna says. And that I've always done, right? So I know that God can work it out. And we need patience. And it's the same in dealing with an individual that you know is going astray and you're trying to help them. You have to be patient. You have to trust that God knows the end from the beginning, that he sees all these things. We don't go about meddling, trying to control what's happening. Uh, we don't get upset. We don't get our feelings hurt just because, um, you know, we're not being heard, right? Right. And so, you know, this is the way that I believe that we need to deal with differences. Now, the question has to do with, you know, we were doing studies. We've been doing studies for a long time. We started these studies before July 18th. We started them back in April of 2020. And um, the American group was doing studies um, separate from the Canadian group. Eventually, the two groups started uh, exchanging weeks. I think the Canadian group wasn't doing it every week anyway. Um, and um, so we, we developed this situation where we were studying and, and they were studying these other groups. Now, we wanted to participate in their studies. But as we started... Uh, to examine, especially after July 18th, and we started receiving this light about July 18th, um, the Canadian and the American groups weren't really, uh, many of the people in the groups, weren't really interested in what we were finding. And somehow, and this is just my perspective, but somehow um, ideas about our studies and about me personally uh, were, were being spread within these groups. And I started to notice this resistance uh, to me saying anything in the studies. And I didn't know where this came from. And this came to a head on a couple of occasions. Once dealing with Mark Johnson, talking about, uh, um, <clears throat> I can't remember the word, it's... Uh, uh, Dealing with the genetics, I can't, I can't think of the word, what they call that. Um, transhumanism, that's it. Thanks, Aran. So dealing with transhumanism. And, and then another time, of course, dealing with Collins' uh, um, study. And, and a couple of other times, just definitely no... Um, whenever conspiracy theories came up, and if I said anything that didn't fully agree with the conspiracy theories or question whether we should be discussing them, uh, there was definitely uh, hurt feelings that people felt that I was judging them. And, and I made some statements which people took as pretty harsh, the idea that uh, those that believe in conspiracy theories uh, 
will will not be saved. They'll be lost. And and I tried to explain what I meant by that, but that wasn't taken. Um, just because I believe it's a method of study that leads us astray. But anyway, um, so here we have, have this situation. And so we're trying to decide what to do. Are we going to just stand aside and, or, you know, or are we contributing to this disunity uh, by our position of continuing our studies? Um, you know, this, this is a thing that I struggle with. You know, at what point do we, um, you know, should I, should I continue going to studies where I'm not welcome? Is, is that, is that the, the thing to do? You know, because I, I question, you know, if I had stopped doing my studies at some point and just said, let's all get together and do the studies with these groups. I mean, obviously, we wouldn't have found the things that we found. But, you know, a person could argue that's what I should have done. Observation. Yep. So um, I was told in no uncertain terms that you are always welcome into those studies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I, 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 I kind of, you know, said that, well, you know, a person has to kind of feel welcome <laughs> in your studies. And when people are accusing you of being a troublemaker or whatever they're accusing you of, it, it's not very uh, conducive to um, that invitation or it's not very consistent with that invitation. Mm hmm. And, you know, that's pretty much it was dropped at that point. I didn't want to create too many waves or anything. I just, you know, I yeah. when I'm in, in those meetings, I often and always actually um, encourage people to come to these studies because of the mm -hmm. findings. But I really don't want to discuss what it is we are finding because oftentimes when I try to uh, uh, download data to people, um, they misconstrue it or, you know, uh, they get whatever thought for whatever words that I use crossed in what I'm trying to communicate and um, gets it jumbled and consequently they don't like it. And so I, I've told them that I'm not willing to discuss it. They are better off to come in and listen to this stuff, how we're determining what it is that we are determining. Um, yeah. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's 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 not going to be of value to you. I can give you bits and pieces, but yeah. you know okay. you won't get the complete picture. Right. So but, uh, observation. What's that, Tom? Uh, I'd, I'd like to come in on that a wee bit. Okay. The uh, the thing is, th they seem to have uh, rather than an objection to people. I think they have an objection to the type of applications they're making. And I'm surprised at that because we'll take you as an example, as you put it out there. After uh, the July 18, when we st when you started to study the letters and started mm -hmm. doing that application with uh, a planet to the lines, it gave total clarity to what had happened. I, I mean, from my limited understanding, I've been with this group a long time, and there's sometimes uh, you've lost me in some of the things, but I think if you persist, you begin to see the clarity again. And them letters give total clarity to what had happened to the movement. I mean, it just opened a whole new way of, of uh, looking at things that we weren't able to do before July 18th. It would have been impossible to see, although you had seen it through the lines. I think it's the seven seven sand, the line of failure, and and you had noticed that, and you had to keep your counsel because the majority of people were going, thing in July eighteen was going to work out the way we thought, and I was part of that group. If you want, you know, I was convinced that we were were on the right track. The reevaluation of that after the disappointment, just like it happened in uh, 1844 and all that sort of stuff, 
it showed us that that we were we were reproducing the, the history again, and mm -hmm. you had to be open to that ability to study it again. And it seemed to be that they weren't open to do that, and they weren't open to use the tools that we were using. I don't see how you can use the lines and study the lines without chronology, because it doesn't give you anchor points. Mm. And they seem to want the full chronology out the window. And yet the work that you and Stephen and then Dwight bringing in his thinking or whatever clarified everything. Uh, and, and, and that's what I can't understand why they can't see that, because there's certain things that you have said about the other groups that have added light to the scenario. So we're willing to accept the light that they're bringing to the table, but they don't want to see the light that this group is bringing to the table. That's my observation, really, you know, that don't seem to be open to it, where, where this group has always looked at the light and say, well, I don't agree with everything, but there is light there. But mm -hmm. they're not prepared to do the opposite. And I think that's the, the impasse that we're in, that we're struggling with. How do we get them to see the light that this group of part of the equation is doing? Right, because we want we want them to see what we see. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's exactly. a, it's a bit frustrating. I mean, I wouldn't have the tools the like of everybody else to do it, but I can see it. You know, if you take the time to look at it, and you can say, well, I don't totally understand what they're doing with the numbers in this case and that case, but if you stick with it, all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and you go, ah, that fits there, that fits there, and that fits there, and I can see where they're going with this, and that makes sense based on our past history. So you apply the past history, which the movement always talks about. You look at the old, and the new shouldn't do away with the old, it should add to it. But they want to take away the new from the old and then start with the old and ignore the new light and see if they can go in the same direction and you can't do it. Yeah, so thanks for that. Um, so then it, when Ellen White says this drawing apart, this scolding and fretting, this pettish spirit of fault finding. Now, I would agree with you that, um, you know, they're not willing to look at the lines, but in order to not look at the lines and to not have other people look at the lines, um, what we do is we do ad hominem attacks. And sometimes these can be quite subtle. Um, so the scolding and fretting, the pettish spirit of fault finding. So let's, let's take a look at a solid example. When Mark Johnson uh, was talking about this transhumanism and that, you know, that if we get vaccinated, we're no longer human. I mean, I was surprised that people weren't saying anything about it. I mean, it's, if that's the case, um, what hope does a Christian have? You understand what I'm saying? Like yeah. Satan totally in control. That means, you know, if, if, if we were vaccinated, we're no longer human. Can we even be saved? I mean, none of this really makes any sense to me. And, and so I questioned him on it. And then he presented a whole bunch of things that were unconnected to transhumanism, just stuff that he had read. And, and, and I said that was nonsense. And I said it was nonsense because it was a nonsense argument. What he was presenting was nonsense. It had nothing to do with the discussion. And now I probably shouldn't have said that and I apologized for saying it. I probably should have approached it some other way. But what was done and, and this had actually even happened, started happening before this, there was this resistance to me personally. And this scolding and fretting, this pettish spirit of fault finding, I at least can say, um, that's what I saw happening, right? And then I, I did emails with, uh, with some of the people involved, uh, particularly Daniel Fontenot because he had accused me of being a Judas. And um, I didn't find anything in his exchange that was seeking to be redemptive. To me, it seemed to be scolding and fault finding instead of actually addressing the points under discussion. 
The same thing happened with the situation with uh, Colin on December 25th, 2021. I was trying to understand and support what Colin was presenting. I was interested in it and I still am. Um, but I was interrupted and told to be quiet, basically to shut up, let Colin finish. And, and that made no sense to me, right? I, I, I didn't accept it and I still don't. I don't believe that we should tell people to shut up in a, in a, in a civil discussion. So this has been used, these conflicts have been used as an excuse by people to not listen to any of our studies. So people who used to go to our studies and participate no longer go to them or participate. And a lot of it has to do with these situations that arose. And, and, and because of the situation with uh, uh, Mark Johnson, I was doing presentations every second week with the American group on the book of Hebrews, and those were shut down. Does that make sense that a conflict like that is going to cause the shutting down of a series of studies? Was my, my actions that egregious that I would then be shut out of presenting at the American group? It's one thing to say that a person is welcome, you know, to sit and listen, than to say that that person's really welcome to participate. Right? There, it would be like the church saying, oh, you, you can come to church. Just don't say anything about the 2520. Correct? Yeah, and that doesn't make sense because those are, those are things that are there that we should be studying. And when you don't want to study those things, there's a reason for it. And it's usually, you know, satanic in nature. Mm -hmm. So, so the question that we have to ask ourselves is what do we do? This is what we've been trying to figure out. How do we share the light that has come to us um, with the movement? And it's just like when we were in the church and we had this light on the 2520 that we wanted to share with people. But they're saying, we, we don't want to have anything to do with what you're, you're interested in sharing. You know, you can sit in church and you can discuss the Sabbath school lesson. But if you bring up anything that we think is any way related to what you're studying, you're going to be shut down. Right? And, and they never have to address any of your points. So, you know, what we believe is that we need to come to the upper room, that we, and this is not talking about them, we have to be able to come into unity with Christ and with one another. We can't change another person. But the question is, do we just be quiet and just wait for God to do something when we have the lines that are pointing to us having to uh, give a message to the movement? So, um, you know, she said uh, silence is eloquence, okay? And then you pointed out um, what that was about and the wording afterwards, which was, unless you can say it with, you know, tenderness and compassion and, and those things, I might be using the wrong words, but the intent is there. Well, they needed um, to come together to study. On I'm a, sorry. Because they were having a battle in in the, basically the church papers, right? And it was a battle that people were aware of. I mean, this was going on. People were fighting this battle. People knew about the controversy. Right. Um, and, and Ellen White said, you need to do a work, and especially to the leaders who were believing the new view of the daily you need to go and start doing a work in the cities right you need to start working for god instead of getting caught up in to the other side and and to both sides but to the other side um she wasn't as upset with but she said don't make 
such a big deal of it. You need to come together. You need to spend time studying with each other because there is light that that was on the side of the new view of the daily. There was some light there that would have helped uh, those who had the old view to see it more clearly because new light makes old light shine brighter. And you can't just That's say right. old light, you know, we're not going to move on any of these points, but there were, were, and, and we, in, in our view of the daily that we have now in this movement, is actually not exactly the same as Miller's view of the daily because we understand a few more things. And so we understand where Miller made some mistakes in a few interpretations of the text. But we know that he was led by God, but he didn't understand the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, so he couldn't have fully understood it. But the new view throws out the whole idea of the, the two desolating powers paganism and papalism and you can't do that it actually destroys the 2300 days so thus putting a, a a basket over our light yeah so you know but the question here is we're reading here about this unity of what has to happen and we have to know that we're not the ones who are scolding and fretting and have a pettish spirit of fault fighting because if we do we are doing the work of satan right so we right. have to ourselves individually examine our hearts, examine our actions, and figure out what our, our motives are, and is there something hid from us. But we also do have a responsibility uh, to share with our brethren, to study with them. They have a responsibility to study with us, but, but we have a, a responsibility to study with them. Now, I'm just talking from my personal perspective. I believe that I've been shut out of those groups that I can't participate because every time I've tried to go back and say something, there's a problem. And, and in talking to Colin about it, you know, he says, there's no way that I can, I, he can have me present anything at the Canadian group, even if he wanted to, because people would be upset. Well, that's not somebody that's welcome. Even if he says, I'm welcome, you know, to come and listen. Right. So, but I, he's welcome to come and present studies. And I've invited him to present studies on Friday night and he won't do it because again, he says people in his group will be upset if he does that, which makes no sense to me. Why would they be upset if Colin's going to present his views uh, to our group? You see, that would be definitely strange because if, if they were so convinced that their views were correct, mm -hmm. someone would come along and say, right, look, let us make a presentation, evaluate where we are and give us your queries or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I tried to go through Colin's view the best that I could and present it as fairly as I could because I wanted to examine it. It wasn't to destroy it and shoot it down. Um. And he said that I did represent it correctly. So, um, so to me, that's that's important. But they're not yeah. even really addressing what we're studying because they have no idea what we're studying. So, um, yeah. one, one thing has came to my mind because of the last, say, week mm -hmm. of studies. You know, some of the some of the conclusions that have been drawn because mm -hmm. of the lines. Yeah. Um, I, I'm aware of all of them and you know <laughs> I was getting some big big eyes at this stuff it was but it was dead it was dead right um, seeing those things spoken of in that way in the scripture uh, uh, all I can say is is that this has been uh, uh, already forecasted we We've seen this stuff, but we didn't know what it was. And our studies have brought us to this stuff. And so as as you've been going along, you have had actually a quite eloquent um, um, way of describing all of these things. I've, I, I followed them very closely. I, you know, I follow the, the um, transcripts as well. I mean, and so I've been pulling those things out and, 
and trying to read those over again and over again so, so that I might have that ability to say those things in my voice with that knowledge, but I, I, I would have had no um, chance of being able to put those things in such an eloquent manner. I'm not, that's not me. I'm more of a, you know, wise guy. What can I tell you? Yeah. Well, so it's not, so the, so, problem, so the problem is we, we, we believe that we're being led to make this invitation, right? Yes. Yes. And it's not something that we want to do. I mean, we made an invitation in the past and, was, and there's this repeat, this one year period uh, that was marked also by Colin. But we can see that that one year period is specifically marked purposefully as this invitation. We made an invitation before. In a sense, it's a one year invitation. Right. We just looked at it for December 25th last year, but it, it includes all the way to December 24th and December 25th this year, right? That's what you understood. Right. And, you know, and then we have this, this idea, well, I could just wait on God, let it rest, do not labor, right? As, as Rosanna suggested. And I'm, I'm not sure what we mean by do not labor, because when we let something rest, I mean, there is a labor that needs to be done when we leave things in God's hands. Um, I mean, all through. They still my, need to be done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So she's saying go forward um, now. So to go forward is, is to me, that's laboring. <laughs> so maybe I misunderstood the first I, part. I kind of agree, but it's not really. It's more of a labor of love. Well, but that's what it's always been. As a Christian, I've always been seeking for the people around me that I've influenced with to labor for them, to help them with whatever um, their problems are. Sometimes that's leaving them to themselves for a while because they have to, because they're not ready to hear something. And um, you have to be very, very patient. It's like gardening. Uh, mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't force uh, your plants to produce fruit faster. Uh, you know, you can't take the flowers and force them open and and try to pollinate them before they're ready. It won't work. And you can't harvest something that's not ripe, that's not ready for harvest. I mean, you can with tomatoes, I guess. But but you understand what I'm saying. There's a time to harvest. There's a time to plant. There's a time to sow. There's a time to weed. There's a time to water. All these things have to be done. And, um, you know, at the time that those things are to be done, you do them. So there, are, there is a time to speak and there is a time to be silent. You know, so when Ellen White says at this time, silence is eloquence in, in connection with the daily. I mean, that's true. But it doesn't mean that at no point in the history are we ever going to bring up the issue of the daily again. Right. I, from my perspective, I think. You, you, there's there's two ways of laboring. There's the labor that you're doing in presenting these messages and recording them and putting them out on the network, which I think should continue. I think the laboring of constantly going to the other side and asking them to come and join us might have to rest a while. There might be more light that in the next week or 10 days that are going to come to the fore that helps them to come to our side. There may be ah. something on their side that happens that opens them up to the fact of what we are studying. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, as far as I can see, and I don't know everything that's going on there because we're a wee bit remote, but mm. as far as I can see, the door on this movement, on this small group, is always left open. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best that we can do. The door's always left open, and if an opportunity is there, and it's not a character assassination, because we don't seem to do that. Other people tend to, if they can't make a point on, on the issue at hand, they tend to go to character. Yeah. And we, we don't tend to do that. Yeah. So I mean, part of what I would want to see, you know, because in making an invitation, it wouldn't be just an invitation for them to come and just listen to us. I mean, 
they need to feel that they that they have an opportunity to present as well. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And, and give us you know, so, so side. Even, as, as I've been thinking and praying about it, I mean, I mean, I would want Colin to present so that we can discuss it. You know, whoever wants to present. Um, and whoever wants to say something, not something where they're going to listen to us, but they could just watch the YouTube video later, right? So that invitation needs to be an invitation to participate, just like in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 30, where northern Israel in, is invited from Beersheba even unto Dan uh, to come to participate in this second Passover. And... You know, in a sense, the first Passover has been passed over, right? That was last December. But I think this one has to happen. If, the, if, if people aren't going to participate, if they're not going to talk together, um, it won't be us shutting them out from light. It will be God shutting them out from light or themselves shutting them out from light. Because what we have studied is light. And it's light for this movement. And this movement needs to know of it. So, you know, what we need to do is we need to be praying that somehow as we approach, you know, these next two weeks, as we approach um, December 24th, you found <laughs> that somehow something will happen. Now, I believe that something will happen. But some, that's something that will happen sometimes is inside of us. I'm pretty sure you're right, Theodore. Okay, sorry about that huge interruption there. No, 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 no. Please understand. The intent of these presentations is to engender conversation amongst brothers and sisters. Mm. There is no need to apologize because what has been shown here is the ability to have a civil conversation amongst like-minded believers. Hmm. Now, one of the best of the comments I've seen from the chat bears consideration. Testimonies. The situation that we have been seeing right now, where there are those that are willing to cast out or shut out or not present to others, is very similar to the papal bull that was okay. issued telling Luther to recant. We cannot afford to act as have the papal prelates. We are not to have that kind of an attitude. There was an issue in the early church where the church had concerns about what Paul was preaching, right? And did not Paul come to Jerusalem face-to-face -face with Peter, James, and all of the other apostles? Yes, that's what happened. Now, here in this particular document of Mrs. White's, we have a symbol before us in the paragraph that we have just read. What symbol is that? Well, paragraph 21 is, and that is the symbol of what? Of midnight. When it came to the wise and the foolish virgins and the cry went out at midnight, were not the wise virgins prepared 
and the foolish virgins unprepared? Mm -hmm. Here is a preparation for us. The Lord has declared that if two agree as touching anything and meet to present their petition, they are not alone, for he, the Lord, meets with them. It is the prayer offered for some definite purpose that is heard and will be answered. Today, when we prepare to close, we are going to have a small session of prayer. We are going to be asking for a definite purpose at this time. Unity in prayer is honored by God. In unity, there is strength. In division, there is weakness. Do we not seek to become strong with our brothers and sisters in this message? Yes. Thank you. So another point, the next chapter is chapter 22. The next paragraph, yes. Yes. And that is, of course, uh, a sign of restoration. Exactly. Exactly the point that I was going to come to. Yeah. But in, in this, in dealing with the midnight cry, unity is the element so much needed in the work of God. This drawing apart, this scolding and fretting, this pettish spirit of fault finding might be better cut away. For it is the root of bitterness springing up, whereby many are what? Defiled. Do we seek for the robe that Christ has offered to us to be defiled or to have spot or wrinkle in it? Mm-hmm. We want we want, don't want to be it to be defiled. We right. He who is imbued with the love of God will be at unity with his fellow workers. He who is at unity with God will seek to come to understand the presentations of others and seek to gain the light that is being offered so that it may be more clearly presented for others. Okay. I don't know why that that happened here. Unity of thought, unity of prayer, unity of action is essential. When this unity is manifested, the heavenly intelligences will observe the earnestness of our prayers and our love for one another in the Holy Spirit. I don't know why that I, I have a window that popped up on my screen and I don't know why it did that. It is necessary at times to hold church meetings when the obstinate persistence of a brother must be brought before the church for decision. But of what value is the decision? My apology. But of what value is the decision of men who are full of suspicion, jealousy, and evil surmising? Who can put reliance upon the decisions arrived at in a board meeting where such a spirit controls the members? We cannot afford to have suspicion. We cannot afford to have jealousy. We cannot be guessing that others have an evil purpose. We must believe the best in all. Who are at this time the true soldiers of Christ? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11. Do not act as though Christ were not a risen, ascended Savior. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Ephesians 6, 12 to 16. Here again, we now have a symbol. We have the 23rd paragraph. If from the presentations that Elder Jeff has made and some of the presentations that we have had, we were to accept this as an additional symbol, what would it be a symbol of? Well, there's the 2300 days. Amen. If we do not understand the 2300 days, if we are not accepting the situation with this, with the daily, the old situation with the daily that the pioneers understood, then we do not fully understand the 2300 days. If we do not understand the 2300 days, we are then setting aside the central pillar of Adventism itself. We've already seen many that would cast out the foundation. Can we afford to cast out the foundation and the central pillar and still be God's unique, separated people? Well, I suppose you could if you're lying to yourself. Okay. No. It can't be done. It just can't be done. Now, explicitly, not according to inspiration. Well, <clears throat> not according to inspiration, whether we take this as according to the Bible or according to the writings of Sister White. No, well, that's that's my point exactly. Those are all inspirations. Okay. Our situation right now, Mrs. White, many years before, was pointing out the need for us to labor, study, and pray in unity. If we're not willing to do that, are we then the disciples of Christ? Not if we're not willing to, according to the beginning of this testimony here that we were looking at. I think it was manuscript release one six something. Yeah, we're we're in uh, manuscript one sixty five of nineteen oh six. Or right. excuse me, excuse me, eighteen eighteen ninety eight. My fault. Yeah, and it said at the kind of at the beginning of this, you know that we couldn't call ourselves Christians if we were wouldn't accept these things for not trying to do them not try to create that atmosphere of brotherly love we are now to yoke up with Christ let a bridle be put upon the tongue pray for the Holy Spirit Gird up the loins of your mind. Humble yourselves. Do not exalt self. 
Can she be any more blunt here? Can she be any more direct with us at this time? No, not really. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. God's true servant stands ready to go wherever providence leads the way. Neither does he call anything which he possesses his own, whether it be talents, learning, position, wealth, or influence. It is the Lord lent treasure that is to be employed to, be strength, to strengthen his flock. We are all to be messengers of his mercy, ministers of his grace. Brothers and sisters, the situation that we are seeing today that are occurring within the movement is no different than what Christ himself faced. It is no different than what the pioneers of the original movement faced. There are going to be those that are going to set aside the word that is given, that are going to set aside the light that has been provided because it does not track with their ideas. We are to wait. We are to let God lead. For right now, the work is in his hands. This movement needs more reliance upon him and less reliance upon man. Now, give me just a moment. Be right back. Okay. We are coming to a point. In the next two weeks, we are looking that an offer is to be made to allow others the open access to join with us. Is this invitation any different from the invitation that Noah made for those of his world to come upon the ark? Is this invitation any different than Elijah made to the nation of Israel? If Baal be God, or is it the Lord that is God? Is it man that is leading this movement, or is it God that is leading this movement? If we are not able to show patience, forbearance, and gentleness with our brothers and sisters, if we are not able to join with them in prayer and seeking God's face, if we are not able to join in understanding the light that is being presented, then are we Christ's disciples? That's the question that is before us now. Now, we have a few minutes remaining. Let us seek our Heavenly Father in prayer. 
let us ask for his guidance as to what is to be done and how we are to go forward. Let us ask that his will be done and that we will have the strength to surrender all to his guidance and to his glory. Let us pray. Anyone that feels led, feel free. Gracious Father in heaven, as we have read this testimony of Sister White, we are being shown of our great need of you. There is little, Father, that we can do without you, without your spirit, without your guidance. There are many that are joined together today, Father, from different parts of the world. We thank you for this opportunity, Father. We accept and we claim your promise. Where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. And the additional words of Sister White, that when we ask specifically on a matter, that this prayer will be answered. Father, you know the condition of this movement. You know the hearts of those that are joined together. You know the hearts of those that are in different portions of this movement. They are all our brothers and sisters. You know the hearts of those that are still remaining within the corporate church to whom this message must first go. We ask now, Father, for your guidance. We are seeking that the door may be open, that others may choose to come to join us, that others may choose to examine what has been studied and the light that has come from it. Father, we wish to be a blessing. We wish to do the work that you have set before us. We seek your guidance. Help us now to understand, to be guided, so that our will is not done, but that your will is done. We can do nothing without you, but through you, we can do all things. We place this in your hands, Father. Guide us now. May your will be done in this matter. May your guidance become clear. Help us now to understand. Direct us now as you would have us to walk. Help us that we may surrender all of this that is keeping us from walking with you. For this, Father, we ask and we thank you in Jesus' name. Anybody's going to offer prayer, remember to turn on your microphone.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence on the Sabbath day. We thank you for your guidance and your mercy and your love. We ask that we can reflect this to others, that this may be our motivation. To that end, Lord, we know that you would have us to have the door open for others to come and meet with us. So this is our prayer in Jesus' name, that others may come to understand and study with us, that we may come to an agreement with them. It is our prayer on the Sabbath day. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, you have been uh, showing us over the past several months our need of you, how unchristlike we are, how self-deceived we can be. And we are thankful, Lord, for this light that has revealed this to us from your word. We know, Lord, that um, if you are to use us in this movement, we need to be united with you, that we need your righteousness, a righteousness that is impossible for us to conceive of. We ask for forgiveness for our thoughts, our feelings, that have, and our actions that have not been in harmony with your word and your character. We ask that your Holy Spirit can bring a conviction to each one of us regarding our own heart, our own sins, that we can confess them and forsake them. We pray for your movement that you have set up and for the, the people in it, the precious souls that you have died for and labored for. Help us to take up our cross and to die and labor for them. We stand in awe of how you have been leading us. We do not fully understand at the time we live in, but we know, Lord, that we are at a uh, momentous period, just as when the Israelites stood before the Red Sea and their enemies surrounded them and they had to go forward. Pray, Lord, that we will not be overcome by the enemy, but that we can be guided by your hand through the waters. We need you, Lord, every hour and every minute. And we pray, Lord, that you can continue to use us to your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, each one.